this is uh, CIB 633 uh, Environmental Hydrology, and today is uh, November 30th, uh, 2021, and this is the last week of lectures, number 15. This is the first lecture, and on Thursday, we're going to have the second and last lecture of this class. The subject today is the continuation with the topic of uh, groundwater sustainability, and we are going to be... Um, covering um, um, three papers that I have written in the past. And the first one is called Sustainable Yield of Groundwater. Can everybody see this paper? Yeah, we can see it. OK, cool. And like I said earlier, uh, before we started the class, uh, this is a very important paper. It's a very well written paper, if I may say so very comprehensive on the subject. I wrote it in the year 2007 as a request from the people of the community of Boulevard. They were having problems with uh, groundwater sustainability, so they asked me to do this. Um, it was not only going to be the subject of groundwater. It's, it is a companion paper to a first paper that I wrote earlier, about six months earlier than this, uh, which dealt with um, general knowledge on the on on the subject but this one's very specific very technical actually and we developed some ideas on this paper but anywhere any anyway let me go uh go over it and uh, uh like i said i've given myself about 30 minutes to touch on the basics of this paper mostly i'm going to be discussing the the uh, the figures the the rest is i guess your responsibility as i said earlier uh, we have uh, water on the surface and under the surface uh, both surface water and groundwater are part of the hydrologic cycle um, they are quite different the surface water is completely renewable as a matter of fact 11 days uh, people, people have calculated around the world the global renewal is 11 days. It varies between 6 and 25 days, I believe. Uh, surface water is completely renewable, but uh, groundwater is not. Groundwater can take months or years or even centuries. Uh, as a matter of fact, it has been established that the average renewal from groundwater for, for groundwater around the world is about 1,500 years. So obviously, nobody's going to sit to wait for the renewal of groundwater for 1,500 years. So technically, groundwater is not renewable, not replenishable. So it should be used with caution, if at all. And we say that if at all with, with sense. I mean, uh, we started societies in general, started using groundwater, pumping groundwater. Because people have used groundwater. Groundwater sometimes pop on the surface, very close to the surface. But people have used groundwater for hundreds of years, if not thousands out of wells, uh, hand wells. Uh, but uh, just over 120 years, societies, Western societies, I guess, with the use of the pump, started pumping groundwater. And that's when, when the problem became um, somewhat acute in certain regions, in not all of them. But there's, there's a problem with the issues of sustainability of groundwater at this point across the world. Um, Okay, uh, another issue, or issue not, characteristic is that first surface water is, is scarce, while groundwater appears to be, there's, there's a, there appears to be a lot of groundwater, at least a hundred times, if not more. So there is a tendency to go after the groundwater in societies in general. Those that can pump the groundwater will pump it, or have been pumping it, for about a hundred, 120 years. Um, the first uh, records for use of pumps for groundwater go back at least uh, to the turn of last century. Okay. So we, uh, we have these um, uh, flags, flags in there uh, in red, in pristine reservoirs, natural recharge is equal to natural discharge. Thus, net recharge is zero. This is a statement by none other than Mr. Thais, 1940. He is considered to be the father of American hydrogeology. He was a civil engineer who put together this very good paper in 1940 and other papers that he wrote too. We just chose to, to focus on that 
on that seminal paper that he wrote in the year 1940. I already shown that paper to you. That's what he said. And basically, I, I like this figure here, uh, put together by the Geological Survey, that explains the, the situation with the groundwater. Which groundwater is always moving, like surface water is also moving. If surface water does not move, it will collect in, in lakes, but the lakes will evaporate. So eventually the surface water from the lake will evaporate. But no, it, it, the, the reason why it does not evaporate is because it's still moving. It's reaching from higher ground toward the lake. Uh, there are some exceptions to it. For instance, we've studied uh, the Salton Sea, and we know the Salton Sea in the past used to dry out. And now it doesn't anymore because, because it is being constantly replenished with uh, agricultural um, sewage or wastewaters, agricultural wastewaters. So this is a very good graph that shows that groundwater is constantly in movement from higher ground toward the ocean, wherever the ocean is. The, the highest gradient, the largest gradient to the ocean will move the groundwater. Another characteristic which is not very well accepted or known is that groundwater, there's no limit to the groundwater. All the groundwaters are supposed to be connected all the groundwaters. In other words, there's only one basin for the groundwaters. One basin on the west and one basin on the east, uh, continental divide of the United States. Uh, there's a few others, but they're the endorheic, and those don't, don't count. The endorheic don't count, but uh, even the endorheic basins in groundwater may be actually flowing outside of the basin, of the outside of the surface water basin. So groundwater is always in movement. It is deep, um, according to Chevotarev, uh, we can consider the 10 kilometer surface uh, on the surface of, of the crust, the crust of weathering. It's called the crust of weathering, where there is enough uh, breakage of the rock and weathering that we could, we could theoretically, if we wanted to, pull by pumping the groundwater out of the earth, out of the, out of the, out of the crust of the earth. So, three scenarios. We put together this graph. Pristine groundwater is in equilibrium or steady state, absence of pumping. Developed groundwater system where there is moderate pumping and uh, it's in equilibrium. There's a certain amount of pumping that, be, that is being affected from the ground and it is in equilibrium. It's not going any deeper. And finally, or third, in the third uh, type of groundwater or groundwater system is a depleted groundwater in non-equilibrium, he with heavy pumping at, at an ever-increasing depth. Has this happened before or is it happening? Yes, in certain places they are depleting the groundwater. There was the case of the uh, Ojos Negros Basin, which we I studied in, uh, in the early 2000s, maybe 15, 20 years ago. There's also the case of uh, Borrego Springs here in the county, the county of San Diego. I have not studied Borrego Springs uh, in detail. But I have uh, read uh, the reports that uh, describe the situation. That it is also a system that it is uh, being depleted. Although in the last five to 10 years, uh, the local people are trying to fix the situation and trying to control it, but it is hard. It is hard not to pump when you have been pumping because you were pumping because you wanted to grow some food or something. And if you can't pump, then you're not going to grow it. You're going to go out of business eventually. So that's the situation, the perspective. All groundwater of economic importance is in constant movement through a porous rock stratum from a place of recharge to a place of discharge. That's right. As, um, as uh, it was mentioned by Thais, place of recharge where, where the water gets into the ground, and then there's a place of recharge downstream somewhere where the water gets out of the ground. Uh, now, uh, Livovich, uh, uh, in the year 1979, told us that um, all the groundwater, all the water that gets into the ground, 98% actually shows up, and we can see it as base flow, and 2% does not. So we call that 2% the, the percolation, the deep percolation amount the one that we can't reach because it, go, it goes too deep and directly into the ocean. 
Although there is a caveat to this. If you're going to go directly into the ocean, it's going to come out very uh, to the ocean. It's going to flow into the ocean close to the coast. So if you're out there on the coast, you can actually pump that groundwater. The deep groundwater, deep percolation groundwater can be pumped to an extent because it could go much deeper. We, we don't know. And then the deeper it goes, the more likely it is going to be po uh, not possible for us to pump it. I, mean, I don't know how deep it would go. It would depend uh, the flow, how deep would the flow into the ocean. It would depend on the geomorphology, of course. And, and it would vary from place to place. This is a graph that was put together by Thais in the year 1940. I like it very much because it does explain graphically some of the things that are happening. For instance, it says in there, you can see it says rejected recharge. Water table at or near the land surface. Basically, what um, Thais is implying over there is that when the water table is close to the surface, the, there's going to be rejected discharge. Discharge that cannot flow into the groundwater because the groundwater is already full. And he said that that's the water we, that we should take advantage of one way or the other. So I guess what you could do is you could, you could pump the groundwater where it is full, full close to the, uh, to the surface because and then there's water around and the water will immediately seep into the groundwater and you would recharge the groundwater immediately. So that's one thing. Groundwater sustainability, and we, this is the subject today, is defined as that used no, is the use of groundwater in a manner that can be maintained for an indefinite time without causing unacceptable consequences. And that's interesting because it was only in 1999 that Ali and his collaborators came up with a real definitive article on this problem, on this subject. And I read his paper, read it many times, and borrowed from it because I thought they had done a good job. I actually happened to know Ali. Ali was a, a chief, uh, chief geologist for the Geological Survey, and he happened to have his residence here in San Diego. I believe at this point he must have retired. He's about he's about my age, Ali, William Ali. And uh, you know, Professor Ponsa is the last one to retire. I'm retired next year, but uh, I should have been retired a while ago. But not yet. It hasn't come yet. Okay, this is a paper that Ali put together. I'm not sure if he originated these graphs, but it, go, it talks about the uh, High Plains Aquifer. And this is interesting. Uh, system A and B. B, B is the, the comparison between the system before and after development, the entire High Plains Aquifer. And that must be the morphology of it, by the way. There's an aquifer out there, there's an alluvial plain, right? And I don't know exactly if the morphologists write right there, but I mean, that's what Ali put together in his paper. Uh, the bedrock, the high plains aquifer, the water table where it is now, and the springs and seeps on the downstream on the east of the high, plain aqu high plains aquifer. Uh, the high plains aquifer, by the way, um, occupies three or four states, northern Texas, Oklahoma, Oklahoma mostly. And I'm not sure exactly at this point. I don't remember the exact limits of it, but no problem. If you're curious, you can go ahead. You just um, Google High Plains Aquifer or Ogallala Aquifer, where Ogallala is spelled O-G-A-L-A-L-L-A, -L -L -A, and they'll give you all the maps. You know how Google is good with this, uh, sharing information across the world. So if you can see in the so-called control volume, we have a natural recharge of 24 and a natural discharge of 24. So what was going in was going out. Nobody was touching the aquifer. The aquifer was kept like that for many, many years uh, prior to development. Development of the Algalala aquifer, I would venture to say that it probably started around either the turn of the last century or the 1920s, but I'm not sure exactly. I mean, that can be verified. It's been 100 years, at least roughly 100 years. After development, then you have the, the, a different balance. You have a pumpage, 830. Um, the units, I'm not quite sure. Uh, 830 recharge for re an irrigation and re an irrigation return flow. So there's natural recharge a little bit and return flow from the pumpage because they're, do, do, they're doing agriculture out there. Decrease in storage, it has decreased in storage somehow. And the natural discharge has been decreased from 24 to 10. So these are the normal and natural things that are going to happen after development. 
a case in point, the, the photo of the, the state of Kansas by Sophocles. Sophocles, a uh, gentleman that worked with the Kansas Geological Survey, and he put together this comparison of the, the streams in Kansas. He said in 1961, uh, he was able to show the left photo in the 1994, so that's 20, 30, 33 years later, uh, the upper streams had, um, had dried out because this moves east toward the Mississippi, uh, the Mississippi River. So it moves east, as you can see, he was able to show that there was, there was base flow disappearance in the state of Kansas. This uh, shows, of course, that the use of groundwater will affect base flow. Uh, Maimon did a very good study in the year 2004. We really can't really get into detail, but I'm just going to go over what he said. He said we should be doing this. We should be understanding the local, regional, sub-regional, and regional effects to develop a comprehensive water budget model, conceptual water budget model, which is difficult for groundwater. And the, excuse me, in this case, it includes surface water and groundwater because everything is related. Surface water would, would become groundwater and groundwater could become surface water. You can't, it's not compartmentalized. It's, it's one thing, water is one thing. Understand the boundaries and rate of replenishment, understand, understand human water needs, consider the temporal aspects of yield, including droughts and floods. Yes, there's gonna be droughts and there's gonna be floods. And that's in nature. And a drought is going to, if you're using the groundwater and you have a drought on the surface, then you're gonna use more groundwater and vice versa for the floods. The floods will have a tendency to replenish the groundwater. Uh, so in the, in the long run, like pluri annual, it should balance out. You will have two years of drought, drought, three years of drought, and then a flood that will replenish it. But if we can continue to increase the amount of, of, of pumping, then it would not be in balance. Consider the effects of yield, I'm sorry, no, consider the effects of new technology and changes in societal perceptions. That is true. The perceptions of society have changed completely. Prior to 1990, there was no environmental concern, hardly any, really. It was in, I'm sorry, not 1990, 1970. 1970, April 22nd, 1970, there was Earth Day. And so we've had environmental perceptions in society for 50 years, in U.S. society. And globally too, why not say that? Work with stakeholders to understand trade-offs and develop and develop consensus, right? Uh, it's gotta be a, a solution or rather an answer for everybody. Uh, this is not just one side. There's several aspects to it. Uh, recognize the interdisciplinary, na nat interdisciplinary nature of the impacts of groundwater utilization because it affects ecology for one thing. And we're gonna cover that uh, uh, Thursday. Analysis. So I want you to read this stuff because it's very detailed, very technical. Uh, we finally get to the global components of precipitation. And this, uh, this uh, graph, I did this graph at the time, that was in the year 2007. And uh, we researched this subject throughout the world. Uh, we came up with these numbers uh, on a global annual basis on the surface of the earth, not on the not on the ocean, but on the surface. Terrestrial water balance. Evaporation and evapotranspiration take 58%. Direct runoff, 28%. Base flow, 12%. So stream flow, total of 40%. And there are 2% of deep percolation. We owe to Livovich this figure. Actually, Livovich said, if I remember correctly, that the deep percolation was going to be between 0 and 5%. But if he was going to do a number, he would put a one and a half percent. I, I think he said that. Uh, I rounded it to two percent because at this point it's not for us. It is not really good for us to start discussing the, the little details. So at two percent, we consider deep percolation. Global value, because it could vary from zero to five percent. Uh, the question is, is, is stream flow 40 percent now if, of the whole thing? Now, if you look at other sources, there's other sources out there that say it's anywhere between 30 and 40%. The number 35 uh, seems a little bit more central, but at this point, this is just an analysis, a general analysis. 35 to 40% does not hold a lot of difference, but that is the, 
essence, uh, the standard for the global, global balance. And it has a lot of different paths. It is most difficult to argue in favor of capturing all or fractions of base flow. In other words, uh, if you are in the developmental area, you want to say, I want water is precious. If I can get a hold of the groundwater, I'm going to pump it. And if you pump it without limit, then you, you draw all the base flow eventually. It will take a while. It will maybe take a few years. But eventually, you will draw all the base flow. Because the base flow has got to stop, and it's got to come back. And it will take some, a while for it to come back, right? Because it's underground. Uh, so it is difficult to argue in favor of capturing all or fractions of the base flow. Why? Because the base flow, technically, and theoretically, and practically, it may belong to other people downstream. Because the reason why, why people, societies went for the groundwater is because the surface water had all been allocated, particularly here in the Western United States. The, West, the surface water were all allocated. There was no water to develop. But everybody realized that there was water in the groundwater, so they started pumping it. That's 120 years ago. But they didn't realize at the time, or they couldn't realize, uh, limited knowledge and so forth, that the base flow was related to the groundwater. Which is kind of interesting because this is not a new concept, by the way. In the year 1750 or 1760, there was a gentleman of uh, French origin, and this has been written in the books that talk about the history of hydrology. Uh, Professor Inche, I think, of uh, Arizona wrote a book on this subject. And it says, uh, it's, been, it's been known, it's been reported that this gentleman uh, all of a sudden came up with the idea that, listen to this because it's important, that if it wasn't raining and, it, and there was flow in the, in, on, in the rivers, then he said it must have come from the groundwater. There was groundwater and the groundwater is flowing and is flowing into the rivers by exfiltration. 1760. So it's been 250 years since we have known that this thing does actually happen. Now, know that it happens to apply it and take consideration of it. It's a different story. We got cases in here. Cases, uh, I'm not going to get into the cases in very detail, but I do want you to read it. These are cases in support of what we're saying in here. Sustainable yield was estimated as a percentage of annual recharge in various places percentage of annual recharge. Uh, although this percentage have nothing to do with hydrogeology, by the way. And here, I don't want to put down my hydrogeology -geo colleagues, but we're arguing in here something that is very sensible, that the uh, uh, ex if evaluation of how much water to pump has nothing to do with hydrogeology. And Ali said that in his paper. Well, he didn't put it nothing to do. He just said that you had to look at other things, not just hydrogeology. So uh, to hire a hydrogeologist for he or she to tell us how much water to pump is a mistake. You should hire a team of people. You should hire an ecologist. You should hire a surface hydrologist, a hydrogeologist, maybe an economist in order to tell us exactly what's going on. Not, it is not just hydrogeology. Groundwater is a commons and belongs to everybody. It is a commons, and we have discussed that before. You know, you heard me talk about the tragedy of the commons. The tragedy of the commons, due to Harding, 1968, says that uh, a commons, a, a resource held in common or in commons, uh, if it's not regulated, it will be exhausted because an individual will gain a lot from exploiting it while, while the, the benefits are due to him, to him or her, the individual, and the cost is shared by everybody. How easy, right? So the commons, if not regulated, will be exploited. Of course, we are arguing in this in this paper that we sh that it should be regulated. But as you guys know already, because I've talked about this, regulation is coming and it will come, but it will take a long time because it's a difficult societal problem. Regulation is always difficult. Synthesis, we already covered this ground. All pumping comes from capture. And all capture is due to pumping. Capture comes from, come from decreases in natural discharge and increases in recharge. So in other words, we're, we're taking from downstream and from upstream. From upstream is fine because it's, it's coming into the place. It's coming to your property. But downstream, no, that is exiting the property. It should be, it, 
it could be argued that it should be left alone because it belongs, it will already belongs to somebody else. It's a difficult thing to de delineate the exact, uh, the exact property of groundwater, by the way, because you could pump it. You could have a, a piece of land, but you can pump the groundwater from a whole a lot, much bigger area. There were a couple of gentlemen from, gentlemen from USGS that did a study in, in Nevada on this. And, and they, their study was, was analytical, it was numerical. I don't know if they actually confronted, I don't think so, because it would have been too long. They pumped 300 years and you can pump in, in the computer, you can pump a thousand years, how much, however time you want. They had all the data and they pumped 300 years. And what actually happened was that uh, the cone of depression start, uh, was getting deeper and deeper and they were drawing water from all over the place. First of all, from the vicinity or near neighborhood, but then eventually the cone of depression started growing and it would cover as much as you pump. So theoretically, it kind of gives us the impression, and I think it is correct, that the more you pump and the, the larger the cone of depression, the, the larger the area that you compromise. And it, it would cover states. By the way, and that's what they said. Those people of the geological survey. Uh, there's a paper. If you're interested, there's a paper on this. I believe. Uh, I don't remember the name right now. We'll get to it. Baseball conservation may be the only practical way of assuring the groundwater capture does not end up sequestering the entire natural discharge. In other words, we should be looking at base flow. That's the first thing we should do. If there's a groundwater development, we should inventory the base flow in the vicinity and start looking at the base flow. And these studies have already been made, by the way. These are not inventions of Professor Ponce. There were a couple of people, people in Maryland and other places out there. Eastern United States also have problems with groundwater pumping, not just the Western, Western United States. And they actually came up with this idea that we should measure the base flow and we, we should evaluate the usage of groundwater in terms of the loss of base flow. And there are numbers attached to this, by the way, very comprehensive study that was done in the year 2004, I believe by Maimon and his collaborators. All these references have been posted in here. Of course, not for you at this point to look at the references. I don't think so. I think in your case, it would be, it would be sufficient for you to read this paper carefully, at least once, if not twice, to get the ideas in your mind so that you can respond to my queries later on. So that's the summary, and I already ex exhausted my time, so I'm not going to go into the summary. The summary is a repetition of what we have said, and we actually have uh, better papers in here that we can go over with. So that is, that's it for sustainable yield of groundwater. Uh, so I'm doing, I'm looking at the, at the, uh, at the time in here. Who owns the groundwater? I put together this paper and then a video, by the way, there's a video. And uh, it doesn't have a date, but I think it must be 12 to 13 years because it was in the year 2006 and seven and eight that we were working with uh, Donna Tisdale of Boulevard, uh, East County. So it, these things came up. Uh, who owns the groundwater? The relation between surface water and groundwater. The question of who owns the groundwater has no straightforward answer. Anybody who can pump the groundwater effectively owns it. However, groundwater is not a volume, but a flow. That is the key to this whole thing. It's a flow, not a volume. And constantly moving from a place of recharge to a place of discharge. Therefore, whoever sits at or near the place of discharge may have a claim on the groundwater which flows to that place. That is a fact. This may be a lake. It doesn't have to be a human, a person, an individual. It could be a lake, wetland, stream, or river. You could try a, a wetland downstream by pumping groundwater, and it has been done. Or it could be an ecosystem, with the, which depends on the recharge and the discharge. So uh, it could be a wetland, a lake, an ecosystem, or somebody that already outright owns the groundwater that is flowing as base flow. Taking a certain amount of groundwater and not returning it through recharge effectively encroaches upon the rights of those who benefit from the discharge, be either flora, flora, fauna, or humans. All groundwater comes from capture. 
within a control volume, capture comes from increases in recharge and decreases in discharge. That is true, too. There is no other way that this could be looked into or at. For the system as a whole, an amount, and any amount of capture effectively decreases natural discharge. Thus, in theory, the optimum groundwater policy is a policy of no use. This has been said in a few, but very few quarters that I've seen. Very few people are actually saying this because it's a very strong statement. However, this situation imposes a socioeconomic hardship on those who, over the years, have come to depend on the groundwater which flows under their properties. This reminds me of Schilf Van Schilfgaard, which in relation to the sustainability of agriculture said, maybe we should be doing this. And then he said, well, I don't really know. He, did, he answered the, at the end of his paper, he says, well, we don't know. We can look into it again. Let's take another look. He was incapable, actually, and I understand what he was, why he did like that. He was incapable of uh, basically shooting himself on the foot for 50 years of work, whether irrigation could be continued or not. It's a tough answer, tough problem, tough answer. Uh, there's a lot of people involved with it. Oh, you, you're going to get a lot of enemies with this, with a statement like this. Uh, but that's the fact. We need to look at first at, at the uh, at the truth, and then after the truth, then we can figure out how to solve it. And of, of course, that will have to be done with legislation. Individuals don't count on this. It's legislation, and for it to the, for the legislation to take place, the pol politicians have got to understand that, and that's why they are giving themselves a lot of time to figure this out. Well, first of all, they don't want to make a mistake, and second, it's a difficult subject, politically difficult subject. A policy of no use is infeasible. My mistake is it's infeasible, even though it would be the most conservative. The solution is to determine a sustainable socioeconomic yield. And this is what Ali was talking in his paper. He said, one of the things he said, which is important, is he said, there's an economic and social effect of groundwater pumping. So let's take a look at it and that minimize, let's minimize that effect. And then you can pump all, if there is no economic and no social effect, then you can go ahead and pump all the groundwater you want. But typically there is because there's neighbors. There's always neighbors. That is the issue here, okay? The solution is to determine a so sustainable socioeconomic yield, a practical value which represent a compromise between the conservative policy of little or no use and the taking of all natural recharge, which amounts to sequestering of all natural discharge, because recharge is equal to discharge in a pristine uh, situation. So we come and we answer the question by saying, yes, it may be pumped, but, pumped, but up to a limit. You cannot pump groundwater without limit. This limit is to be imposed not based on hydrogeologic considerations, but on a reasonable compromise between the rights of all stakeholders. Now, here comes the word stakeholders. When I was, when I was at the beginning of my career, this word did not exist, by the way. Like stakeholders? In the usage that we give it now? No. It was only around the 70, late 70s and early 80s that I became aware that this word existed in in environmental science. It's, it's a word that has to do with environmental science. Uh, what is the effects of some use and who is likely to be affected? Uh, the, a stakeholder is a, a person or entities that are affected both positively and negatively by the action. In this case, the action would be the pumping of groundwater. In practice, and here we're coming with a, with a, with a solution to this. A solution. We say sustainable yield may be expressed as a percentage of natural recharge, even though in nature there is no relation between them. Studies are needed on a local and regional basis to determine appropriate percentages. Initially, a sustainable yield equal to 10% of natural recharge is deemed to be reasonably conservative, while higher values may reflect the need for a socioeconomic compromise. A value of 100%, which was accepted, accepted practice in the past, is no, no longer considered appropriate. In the past, uh, people used to calculate the recharge and they said, well, that's a, this is free, the re we can take all the recharge. They were not considering that there was recharge, I'm sorry, discharge downstream. 
So that is obviously a mistake. So what the percentage of recharge? We say 10% because we believe that that's reasonable, it's a good compromise. It is not a low value either. Uh, but you could go 20, 30 or whatever, and the higher you go, the more, the more uh, people or the more situations downstream are you going to be affecting. And by the way, they will sue you. In the United States, they will sue you immediately the next day. And you know how it is here in the United States. In other countries, they're not as so happy as we are, but they'll eventually sue you too, okay? So you'll have a problem if you start the, let's say, uh, taking too much and other people feeling that you are taking too much. Increasingly, base load conservation is being taken as a measure against which to assess sustainable socioeconomic yield. And base flow conservation, like I said, it's all over the literature. We need to conserve base flow. Um, there's an example in Peru, by the way, which I looked at many years ago, maybe 10, 15 years ago. Um, there was uh, mining development. Peru is in the middle of the Andes. You know that. The Andes, from the north to the south, in the center, in the center of the country. Peru is the Andes. Of course, there's a little bit of Andes in Colombia too, but not as high. And in Bolivia, there's Andes too, but also not as high. Peru is the central, the, the central Andes are in Peru, the Andes Mountains, the Andes Range, okay? And, um, and there's groundwater in there. Let me see where was I now. Um, well, at any rate, so, oh, the example that I was gonna, I was gonna talk to you about. Uh, in the southern part, oh, there were mines developed beginning in the 1990s, like in 1990, 1995. There was a president, I don't know if you remember, uh, Mr. Fujimori, that was president of Peru for 10 years, and he allocated the mines to various companies, mostly international uh, companies. Uh, international meaning US, Europe, and so forth. They went over and started mining. Now, in order to mine gold, by the way, in order to mine gold, you need to use a lot of water because that's just the way it works. Okay, you gotta, you gotta run the cyanide with the water. The cyanide will, will pull out the gold, will concentrate the gold, and then they will take the gold in, in, in bars, a gold bar, or take it at somewhere, wherever, wherever they're gonna take the gold bar. But it has to be usually the, the, the amount is usually like one per thousand, something on that order. At least I think I'm correct in there. In other words, one, one part per thousand will be gold and 999 will be just soil, right? So you, but you gotta extract that gold. In order to extract the gold, they need a lot of water. So they started using the gold, uh, the mines, the gold mines, started using the water in the vicinity. And eventually within 10 years, they must have started uh, affecting the base flow in the vicinity because the local people realized that their flows were, were receding. They didn't, they didn't have the water anymore that they used to have before the gold mine was there. Before the, so they protested and uh, it became a political problem. Uh, at the beginning, the government didn't know what to do and they said, oh, well, you know, people just kind of say, Let's not worry about it. But they insisted, and then it became a political problem eventually that there were there was violence involved with it. Violence meaning they the people uh, decided to protest, and there was uh, there was fights and so forth, violence, and a few people were killed by police. They were trying to control the situation. You know, this thing happened, I believe, about 15 years ago and even 10 years ago. No. 25 and 10 in 20 years ago, roughly on that order. Or even earlier, like it was like 2005, I believe 2005 was the height of this whole thing. And then eventually the government had to come in and uh, basically I wasn't there when they started to solve this problem, but basically at the end they decided not to use the ground the, the groundwater anymore, the mining company. So I believe what they're doing now is that they're doing a desalination plant in order to pump you know, they get the salt, get the water out of the out of the ocean, which is right next, the, right there, and then pump it up and use it, and not touch the the 
uh, ancient aquifers that are out there that have been used for people for agriculture for for times that we don't even remember. It would be a thousand, fifteen hundred, two thousand years. People, just local people, local Peruvian agricultural people, or or uh, I guess you could say uh, the people that uh, grow uh, food stuff, agriculture in the high, in the highlands. So that problem was solved, uh, albeit after some problems, political problems. But as you can see, uh, there are issues with this is mine and it's not yours, which is politics, of course. So this happens and has happened every, everywhere. There's other places, not just in Peru, in Mexico, in the U.S., there's places where political problems has happened, have happened due to the use of groundwater. I can remember when I was in Mexico many years ago, like 15 years ago, uh, I don't remember the town. It doesn't matter, but I was in the town and I, I went out just to visit. I was sightseeing and I saw people uh, demonstrating politics and they were uh, uh, protesting uh, the, the mining, the gold mining in the region by some company that was out there. The local people felt that they were being affected theoretically or technically by the use of groundwater by the mining company. Needless to say, and I said it before, I'll repeat it, the mining company, gold mine, can't operate without an ample supply of water in order to wash the cyanide into the rocks and pull out the gold. So they have to do it. At this point, I believe the situation in Peru has been controlled because uh, they had to come in and act. But there's still political problems. People still protest because they feel that uh, somebody from outside came over and started using their water. Well, theoretically, without their permission, they just struck a, uh, uh, an agreement with the government. And the government, of course, uh, technically, they will be ha the government is happy because they get a share of the exploits or the proceeds, usually 10, 20 percent, 10, 20, even 30 percent. I'm not exactly privy on the numbers, uh, the percentage that are used to share. OK, so let, let's move on in here now. We have a few minutes here. Uh, let me see if I can get in here. So who owns the groundwater? We already know. Technically, nobody. Anybody can pump the groundwater. There's no regulation. Uh, the, the who owns the groundwater is determined after a fight, usually, at this point. It was in Peru and it was in many other places, in Mexico too. Um, it, it would be like that. Uh, there would have to be some kind of a fight. In, yes, I'm asking. Noise in here, somebody wants to talk? Okay, let me keep on going here. How much groundwater? How much groundwater? What? How much groundwater to pump in a sustainable fashion? This is the third contribution. As you can see, we, I'm going a little fast in here, which is fine. Uh, we have a lot to cover. Uh, this is a very important contribution of mine. Uh, it summarizes everything. And uh, I read it this afternoon and it's quite correct. Correct. I agree with uh, what I have said in here. Let me see, this is dated 8-12-08. So that means 2008. And that's the last time I, I changed this. Most of this work was done, by the way, for the benefit of um, Boulevard. Boulevard is a community, one of the communities, eastern communities of San Diego County, by the way. It's a place that a lot of people don't know. If you ask people in San Diego City, where is Boulevard? They'll say, where? Where is it? I don't know. You know, remember, I've said that about the Salton Sea in one of our videos. You ask people in San Diego, where's the Salton Sea? They say, oh, I think I heard about it. I really don't know where it is, right? So there's a lot of ignorance in the city about what happens in the rural areas. Um, most people are not used to going out, to the, out of the city. So, um, so that's the situation. Boulevard is a community of San Diego. It lies about at a distance of about 70 miles from downtown east. If you go on I-10, I-10, I believe I-10, toward uh, Yuma, uh, 70 miles will get you to Boulevard. Uh, it's, uh, I think it's a little bit after Hakamba. First Hakamba, then Boulevard. And then you get into, you have to cross the hill. Eventually you get to El Centro, but El Centro is 120 miles. 
So 70 miles, how come I must be around 60, 60, 70 miles. So you get over there and then you drive south because uh, I-10 I is not on the border. Then you drive south and you get, actually Boulevard is right there. But if you want to get to the place where we have worked, which is in Tierra del Sol, you got to drive further south until you hit the border. When you hit the borderline, the border between U.S. and Mexico, that place out there is called Tierra del Sol, where Donna, Donna Tisdale, who hired me to do these projects over the last 15 years, uh, I think it was from 2005 to 2017 or 16 or 17. For 10 to 12 years, I worked with Donna. I believe now she's not doing any of this kind of work don't know exactly why. Um, you know, people retire from doing things. And Donna is a little bit younger than I am, but she's still up there. So why should groundwater use be limited? That's the first question. It appears to be a whole lot of groundwater. Why should we limit it? Because much of the groundwater is in transit to the surface water. That's the answer. It's not a volume. It's a flow. That's a very key question, a key issue to understand this problem. Therefore, pumping groundwater and not returning it to the ground is effectively consumptive use. You're, you're, you're taking groundwater and not returning it. Amounts to capturing potential quantities of surface water. When the surface water has been fully allocated, a conflict arises. Remember the numbers that uh, Lipovich has given us. 2% is lost. So if you, if you use 2%, we, you're fine. You're, the, you're within the number that will get lost or the figure that will get lost. But 98%, that's one in 24, or 24 out of 25. Uh, no, not 24 out of 50. One out of 50, uh, you know, 98%, right? It's 50. Um, one fiftieth. Uh, it's lost to deep percolation, and 49 are coming out somewhere out there. And those could already have uh, an owner, be it society at large, uh, you know the rivers, the rivers need some water because if they have water, if they're ephemeral or intermittent, there's biota, there's plants, there's fish and so forth that need, it, need to be supported. You can't just dry the river and forget about the fish. That would not be proper in terms of the environmental problems, creating environmental problems. The fish are there and they should be protected. So. What should be the limit? We talked about this in our papers too. The amount of groundwater that can be pumped depends on the interaction, on its interaction with the surface waters and whether those surface waters have been fully allocated or not. So here in the Western United States, all the surface water have been allocated. There is no surface water free to dispose. That's not the same thing in the central and in Eastern United States. I'm not gonna talk about that because I really don't know, but I know that here, in the Western United States, all the surface waters have been allocated. Special care is required when groundwater is pumped near streams. Is groundwater pumped near streams? We're going to talk about an example. The following is an example of this. A first approximation is to limit groundwater pumping to an amount equal to the deep percolation. This is a first approximation. Nobody has actually done this calculation before. I was the first one that came out and said, you should use a percentage of the precipitation or a percentage of recharge. If you have recharge as a percentage of precipitation, then you can and then you can talk about percentage of recharge or precipitation. In this case, it's two percent. That's the figure that Livovich came up with. This limit may be increased in cases where detailed interdisciplinary studies warrant it. How much groundwater are we using? Uh, Professor Pons is coming over with two percent, but what is it? What is the actual number? Well, we examined this and GS. The Geological Survey has done a lot of hydrogeologic studies. The, fi the figure, the average pumping in the United States, it's a figure that is about 8%. So we are, we theoretically, according to the Geological Survey, we, we are pumping about 8% of precipitation. Professor Pond says we should pump 2%. Well, I'm just saying this is a, is a, is a figure to work with. Okay, so reduce to 25% of what you're doing and you'll be fine. Well, of course, they're not going to do it just because I said it, but that's the point that we need to reduce it because right now it's, it's technically high. Our position is that this should be studied on a watershed basis. And the analysis is done by watershed. 
even though we realize that there's the, the, con the connection is not there. The, the, there's no surface water. There's no limit to the groundwater basin. And even though for practicality, as an issue of practicality, we need to say, this is the basin, this is a surface water basin, and we are going to impose a limit. Also, this kind of analysis assumes that we know the basin, and then we are all in agreement as to what we're going to do in the basin. That would require that the management of basins, of hydrologic basins, be done centrally by some agency that handles the basin. And that's technically not the case. It hasn't happened, and it probably won't happen in the foreseeable future. There are places like uh, the U.S. has recognized this long time ago. We created the Tennessee Valley Authority in the 1900s or 1920s, I believe, to do the development of the, ten to do the dams of the Tennessee that needed to be done. So that implies Tennessee Valley, the watershed of the Tennessee Valley. That was the first and, uh, to my knowledge, the only time where the U.S. has talked about, let's do water resources management in this basin, in this surface water basin, the Tennessee Valley. Other places, it hasn't happened. Furthermore, we have neighbors. We have Can Canada and we have Mexico. And there's places that uh, span, there are watersheds that span both uh, countries. And we certainly have not reached any agreement as to how we're going to use it. There's no conjunctive management of a basin uh, uh, compared, or rather, by two countries. That hasn't happened. I don't think so. I would hesitate to say, or I would like to say that I don't. I have not seen any uh, binational management of a watershed. There could be out there, not that I don't know. I mean, it's just that it, it, that's hard to find. Why should the use of groundwater be regulated? Groundwater is indeed the ultimate commons. Therefore, Harding's tragedy applies. In the absence of regulation, any natural resource held in common will tend to be overexploited until it becomes unsustainable. Thus, it makes perfect sense to regulate groundwater use. We should be regulating all the commons, but I mean, that's tough, particularly since we're nations. There's 240 nations. They would have to get together because a commons is a commons and there's no limit. There's no limit to the commons like, like the am atmosphere is a common already, and we have a problem now with the atmosphere. The atmosphere is that anybody that's pumping fossil fuels to the air, they're, they're being diffused throughout the world. So everybody's affected. We know that. We already studied that. Why pump groundwater at all? In regions where surface water is limited, the use of groundwater is often essential to support socioeconomic development. We have come to rely on it like we're used to it already. It's 120 years. We've been doing this for 120 years. That's almost five generations. Our grandparents and the grandparents of our grandparents started doing this at the turn of the previous century. The only way to avoid depletion is to limit groundwater use to a reasonable, sustainable amount. Where sustainable is technically a moving target. Nobody really knows what exactly is sustainability. Sustainability would have to be expressed in years, 100, 500, 1,000, 10,000, and, and your opinion uh, could vary. Some people would say, let's look at 100 years. Others would say, no, no, it's too low. Let's say 1,000 years. Others would say, 1,000 is just too low. Let's use 10,000. So people will not and have not agreed as to exactly what is the horizon or the time horizon for the issue of sustainability. We're still arguing about that. Um, the the uh, uh, na uh, United Nations, when they came up with this concept in 1987, they said it was forever. <laughs> forever is a very strong word, right? Forever means forever, right? It's a, it's a very absolute value. And a lot of people are not uh, likely to accept that position. So we're in a political situation here. Some people agree, some people don't agree. It will actually depend on who are the politicians and who is going to win the elections, actually. That is a fact that cannot be uh, discussed. It will depend on who wins the elections for these things to be applied. 
I don't want to talk about it. We are very familiar with this subject. All of us are very familiar with this subject. What studies are required in an evaluation of groundwater potential? First and foremost, an assessment of groundwater potential should evaluate the effect of pumping on the neighboring surface waters and related groundwater dependent ecosystems. Not only the, re the neighboring surface waters, waters, but also the groundwater dependent ecosystems. There's phreatophytes, there's plants that are drawing from the vado zone. If we dry the vado zone, we lower the groundwater, there's gonna be problems. And these are the problems that, were conf that, that the people of Tierra del Sol and Boulevard were confronting it. We're confronting. I've already talked about this extensively. Remember that huge tree that had a two and a half meter, about eight feet diameter, and it was being in danger of being dried out several years ago because, because they were going to pump. The, there were developers out there that were going to pump the groundwater in McCain Valley, which is right there. McCain Valley is right there, next to that forest of, um, of, um, of oak. Uh, what is it called? It's oak. It's a, it's a for, it's an oak forest out there. Um, so um, where, where was I? Okay. First and foremost, what 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 studies are required? First and foremost, an assessment of groundwater should evaluate the effect of pumping on the neighboring surface water in groundwater dependent ecosystems. This requires that you have an ecologist or biologist or botanist on the team because the hydrogeologists are not going to do it. The straight civil engineers won't do it either. Uh, I happen to be, uh, I guess you could say enlightened would be the word, but that's too much. Actually, uh, I guess you could say knowledgeable or civil engineer that has actually uh, come across the disciplines in order to uh, involve other disciplines, become interdisciplinary in the process. The sustainable amount to pump is not related to the aquifer volume, not at all. As a matter of fact, the aquifer volume is infinite. That was demonstrated by the people that did the study in, Arizona, in, in Nevada. That was about 20 years ago. Or to the recharge, but rather to the maintenance of base flow in the local and regional vicinity. So base flow is the first uh, item that is going to be affected. Uh, and then we're going to see it. It's, it's going to be visible. Therefore, baseline studies of base flow should be a required component of evaluation of sustainable groundwater potential. And I, I'm going to say this because it needs to be said. In the past, we were, in, we were disciplinary. So people studied their discipline and they didn't know anything about the disciplines in the neighborhood. And I happen to know about this. I was going to publish a paper in the year 2000 on precisely on this issue of the limit between groundwater and surface water. And it, 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 was, it was showing the base flow and so forth. And uh, I submitted it to a European journal, I don't want to mention names, and I was declined. And I was declined because the, the title of it said something about groundwater or something. We we're going to do some groundwater. And, and it was sent to groundwater geologists and they misunderstood what I was trying to say. And I happen to know this for a fact. And they said, oh, well, you know, this stuff has already been done or it's not correct. And so they declined. Uh, interestingly, though, by that time, it was around the year 2000, 1999, the web has already be, had already become available to everybody. It had been five years since anybody could post stuff on the web. I believe the first gentleman or lady that posted stuff on the web can date themselves back to the year 1994. I believe, because in 1993, everybody that was producing the, the browsers were fighting among themselves and, and it, was, it was a fight that needed to be settled. But by 1994, it was settled. And therefore, people started using the stuff, the, the web. So 1994, it took me five years, by the way, too, too long to get on the bandwagon because I established my website in 1999, five years later. Why? Well, it takes long to be, for people to decide to do new things, right? It took me five years. There are some people out there, mind you, that are wondering whether they should be on the web or not now. Huh. I have a couple of friends that just asked me recently, how do I get my website up? 2021. That was 
27 years after it all orig originated in the US, right? So that's the way it happens. So base flow studies. Uh, so I was really uh, disappointed and uptight that I had to decline on, su on a subject that the reviewers didn't know about. But, you know, so be it. You win some, you lose some. It, at the time, I published that paper on the web. And I still have it published on the web. Because I believe that eventually, if our paper is published on the web, and I said it before, and I'll repeat it again as many times as necessary. If you publish your paper on the web, people will actually look at it eventually. It may not be as prestigious, but it will, they will look at it. They will read it. Uh, I can show you, I can give you many examples of that, that, that is actually happening. It is against the grain of how we used to do it. You know, we were told for many, many years that we should publish in recognized, uh, reputable journals. But you know what? There were 10 journals, maybe 20, 30 years ago. Now there's 1,000, 10,000, 20,000. If you look at all the journals in the US and the world, Google it. The number would be on the order of 20 to 30,000 at this point. So the question is not only, not, not the, the question is, and I'm, let me say this because I need to say this. The question is not who's writing, but who's reading. There's so much volume out there, plus at the, at the web, which is an infinite, is an infinite resource. So there is the issue here. Uh, the situation has changed completely from what, what it was when I was a young man, uh, you know, when I began my career 50 years ago. I had three journals and I would publish in three journals. And that's what I've done, three journals. I can name them right now in the water area. Not only did I only publish in three journals, I wasn't reading any other journal. <laughs> there was only three journals that I could read, I could get my hands on. And right now, how many are they? Look at that. How is base flow related to groundwater? Base flow is the dry weather flow of streams and rivers. It originates in groundwater, therefore it is related to groundwater. Depletion of groundwater results in the disappearance of base flow. That's what's said by many people, Maimon in particular, Ali also. These are great people. Uh, not necessarily groundwater experts. Uh, Ali is a surface water guy, for sure. So this cause-effect relation has been thoroughly demonstrated. And finally, how is groundwater sustainability assessed? To assess groundwater sustainability, there is a need for interdisciplinary studies that consider the geological, hydrogeological, hydrogeological being only one of several, hydrological, ecological, the plants and economic relations, hydrological. The, the conventional hydrogeologists usually don't look at the hydrology. Interesting as I may say it so, and I have examples to show you that. Pending such studies, the 2% rule, groundwater use should not exceed 2% of precipitation, may be taken as a reasonable estimate of sustainable groundwater utilization. Uh, it's an easy number, probably not going to be applied, but it is a working number that we should work, we should use with, or you, we, you should use this number. Uh, society, let me say this, that this whole subject is under study by a whole lot of people here in California as well as elsewhere. And they will eventually come up with an answer to this. It will be a, a difficult answer to get, but they will get it because we need to do something about what, groundwater. Whether it takes five years to 10 years or 30 years as the state of California has decided to take, it will be eventually fixed. It's like global warming. We're talking about 19, uh, 2050 to 2100 in order to solve, quote unquote, the problem of global warming. You can see there's time involved in this. Okay, so now I am a little bit ahead of, the, of my time here. So I'm going to go on to the next subject, which is how did Las Vegas get its name? How does La Las Vegas get its name? This is an interesting. When I learned about it, I, got, I was fascinated. I, Las Vegas is Spanish. Everybody knows that. What does it mean? It means a fertile area, a, a, an area where things grow without us doing anything. We don't have to grow anything in Las Vegas. It, it has a, a right combination of water and nutrients, and therefore it's called a vega, okay, in, 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 in Spanish. 
So how is it that Las Vegas got a Spanish name? Well, I guess you could say that how did San Francisco get its name? How Los Angeles? They got it because uh, uh, in the, up to the mid 1800s, um, this area here, Southern California, Arizona, and uh, parts of Nevada were part of Mexico. And in 1845, I believe, 1845 to 1849, they became part of the United States. So basically, we inherited the name of Las Vegas, just like we inherited San Francisco, Los Angeles, and San Diego, by the way. Okay, but the question is, why Las Vegas? Why didn't they give them a, why did the, the Mexicans that settled that area early did not give it a, a name of a saint like they did in California? And the answer is here, right here. And, and, and we get it from a, from a source which is History of Las Vegas, and another source which is called Rafael Rivera, and a third source which is called USGS Circular 181182, which are based in here. I believe I can, I can click this. No? For some reason it's not there. I gotta look into this. I'll, I'll go find it and I'll refresh, I'll, I'll reset this, this, this site in here. But history of Las Vegas, let me see if that, if that works. Yeah, that works. History of Las Vegas. That's in there. That's a source. Okay. So now let's take a look at the history of Las Vegas because what I did here was I basically condensed what these three references say. Because I wasn't there at the time, certainly. I am a, a researcher that finds what I believe to be the truth and verify it and confront it with other supposedly the same truths and then come up with a story. So we came up with this story. In 1829, Antonio Armijo, Mexican trader from Santa Fe, New Mexico, led a 60-person and 100-mule caravan along the Spanish Trail from New Mexico to Los Angeles, from Santa Fe to Los Angeles. He was an important guy out there in Santa Fe when he was Mexico, still Mexico, 1829. While Armijo's caravan was camped on Christmas Day, about 100 miles northeast of present-day Las Vegas, a scouting party rode west in search of water. Rafael Rivera, a young Mexican scout, I believe Rivera was at the time 18 or 19, wandered away from the rest of the group into the unexplored desert in search of a shortcut. He headed west on the Colorado, well, no, west off the Colorado River and stumbled upon what is now known as the Las Vegas Valley. Camping on top of a mesa that overlooked the valley, because if you've been to Vegas, you know there's a lot of hills on the, on the surroundings. Las Vegas is surrounded by hills. So if you are on top of the hill, you can see the valley right there below. Okay, um, Camping on top of a mesa that overlooked the valley, he could see springs and meadows thriving in the middle of the desert. Springs, artesian springs, and meadows, meaning greenery. After two weeks, Rivera rejoined the group and led them to the valley. A uh, statue of Rafael Rivera is now could be find uh, could be found in Las Vegas now. By the way, we have recently visited Las Vegas, and I did a video on Rafael Rivera statue. By the way, I will post it for you. The Armijo party noted the unusual fertility of the plains surrounding the, the springs, and so they called it Las Vegas, which exactly means that. Uh, there's Vegas in various places. Uh, there's a Vegas uh, next to Madrid, the Vegas of Madrid in Spain. There's also Las Vegas next to Bogota in Colombia. I was there. I have a friend that has a house over in Las Vegas next to Bogota, within 30, 40 miles of Bogota. Las Vegas of Madrid is within short distance in Madrid in Spain. Um, so Vegas, Spanish, which is in Spanish translates into fertile plains. I told you already, for a plain to be fertile, it has to have water and it has to have the nutrients which are there because this is a desert. You know, in a water, in a desert, all you need is to throw, put water in there and there's a lot of, uh, how you can say, juvenile, the juvenile nutrients, meaning the nutrients that have never been used. They, they did not recycle. They originated in the rock that came, became sand and then became plant, okay? The fertility was due to the presence of, an art, of the artesian springs in what otherwise would have been a, a desert landscape. 
In other words, the Las Vegas Valley was full of water. It was so full of water that the water was popping off the, out of the ground, which is exactly what happens when you have an artesian situation. More than 100 years later, due to the excessive pumping of groundwater, the original artesian springs of the Las Vegas have all but disappeared. And this was said, by the way, by US, USGS Circular 1182, which I'm going to recre recreate now. Something happened to the, to the link, but I'm going to recreate it. I'm hopefully going to do this tonight, so you can take a look at it when you study. Between 1907 and 1990, the elevation of the water table dropped between 50 and 300 feet in the central location, right around the place where that we call the Strip, Las Vegas Strip, with the greatest drop occurring near the center of the valley. There's a map out there in that report, by the way. I didn't put it in here, but there's a map. So if you're familiar with Las Vegas, you can figure it out where is the hole, the 300 feet hole of water. Moreover, ground subsidence, a direct result of groundwater mining, remains a significant threat, a significant threat in many areas. Groundwater, ground subsidence. So groundwater pumping is not only depletion and, and uh, affecting the plants in the vicinity, you can also affect the buildings in the vicinity. They get settled. Interesting. Mexico City is a very big example. Mexico City has 20 million, 25, I think, at this point, million people living in there, in, in the valley of Mexico City, which is an endorrheic valley, by the way. You know what endorrheic means. It's closed. Uh, 25 million people, they need water, right? The water is brought in, whatever it is, but they, they're using water. So in the past, they have been pumping without limit the aquifers. And it turns out that these aquifers are clay, they have clay. So it took a while for the clay to respond to the problem, but eventually it started settling. The entire city is settling. The entire city is settling. Uh, luckily though, about 50 years ago, uh, the Mexican government found out that in fact the settling was due to the pumping. So they regulated, they kind of stopped the pumping. I believe the, the pumping has diminished. I don't have the numbers for you today or tonight, but the pumping has, the, the actual pumping of the, of the aquifer below Mexico City has been reduced in its volume. Not eliminated, but reduced. So they reduced the settling also. The settling has been reduced, but it's still continuing. It is still continuing. Uh, currently, there is a problem. And the problem is that the, um, the cathedral in downtown Mexico City, in what they call the Zocalo, the main plaza, is actually settling, settling quite considerably. So they called, the government called in the geotechs to figure out what to do. So the solution was to, um, to balance the building in its settling, so not allow it to settle, to settle non-uniformly. So the building is actually due to engineering of the subsurface of the ground, actually. Engineering, geotech, foundation engineering is settling, but it is settling at a uniform rate. So therefore, hopefully, it will not be subject to stresses that could tear it apart. That is actually happening with Cathedral, which is about 500 years old. It's about 500 order, 500 years old. Mm -hmm.